get started. So, uh, good morning and welcome to this week's IGC Pizza Lunch. Um, we're so, back after we're, a break. <laughs> uh, so, so far we've heard uh, quite a bit about LIGO, which makes sense because that's where this field is really uh, taken off. Uh, but as you all know, you've probably seen the LIGO sensitivity curve enough times to find out that uh, LIGO is basically blind with below a few tens of hertz. Uh, but of course, the universe has many sources uh, at lower frequencies. So today and next week, we're going to hear some talks on the low frequency gravitational wave sky. Um, first up, we have our own Dan DeRazio. So Dan arrived here last fall as an Einstein Fellow. Um, his work has been featured in uh, the New York Times and published in Nature. I just didn't want to get those mixed up. Uh, and uh, and uh, before he was here, he was a PhD student at Columbia University where he worked with uh, Jeff Levin and Zoltan Hyman, which of course makes him uh, Avi's academic grandson. Um, so without further ado, here's Dan. All right, thank you very much. And thanks for, thanks for coming. So. <clears throat> As John said, up until now, we've been hearing about the high-frequency gravitational wave sky and uh, the amazing things that LIGO has done detecting uh, stellar mass black hole binary mergers. Uh, and so today we, for the first time in the seminar series, enter the realm of the lower-frequency gravitational wave sky, um, where some of the primary sources of gravitational radiation are the mergers of very massive millions to billions of solar mass black holes at the center of galaxies. Um, hence the title of my talk. So I think one of the main things to distill it down that I want to get across today or talk about today is that is the astrophysics that we can learn from the low frequency gravitational wave sky. So just as LIGO can learn about uh, formation channels of stellar mass black hole binaries from their gravitational wave detections, um, in this case, we can learn about the evolution of uh, massive black hole binaries and galaxies, which can teach us about the uh, environments, the unknown kind of environments at the center of galaxies, and also this mutual buildup and growth of black holes along with galaxies. And I'm going to specifically uh, focus today on how the electromagnetic uh, side signatures of these sources will help us to do that. Uh, and I'll mention a few things next week. Luke Kelly will talk about a Similar idea, but from the gravitational wave background side. So to start, uh, the last two seminars focused on LIGO and gravitational waves in the frequency range of uh, you know, tens to 1,000 hertz, kilohertz. Um, and today, we're going to talk about the kind of 1 hertz down to nanohertz uh, gravitational radiation. And as I mentioned, one of the major, major sources of this are the in-spiral mergers of massive black hole binaries. Uh, you can understand this because the gravitational wave frequency is you know, twice the Keplerian orbital frequency. And so for 10 solar mass black holes, it's roughly kilohertz at merger. But if you scale that, the frequency scales with the mass of the binary. If you scale that down to you know, 10 to the 5 solar mass black holes, you're at 10 millihertz, or down to 10 to the 10 solar mass black holes, you're at roughly microhertz at merger. And so the uh, instruments, I want to talk about the instruments that are going to be able to detect these low frequency gravitational waves. And first is something called, well, there's a plan. These are these space-based interferometers. So essentially LIGO put into space, uh, you can if you put a, something like LIGO an interferometer in space, you can beat down this low frequency noise due to seismic and weather activities that Rainer Weiss talked about in the first seminar. Uh, and you can also have much, much larger arms in space to uh, get higher sensitivity at these low frequencies. And so the main instrument planned to look for these uh, gravitational waves in the range of roughly a hertz to 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 hertz, which again, as I said, correspond to roughly the merger of these uh, supermassive black holes is uh, so-called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, which has just been revived very recently. Actually, my first year of graduate school, when I decided I wanted to work on uh, things that LISA will see, it was canceled. 
and then it was just revived this year. Uh, and so the plan is to put three spacecraft, each with a test mass sitting in the middle and shooting a laser to bounce off the test mass in the other spacecraft uh, in this constellation of, uh, yeah, as I said, three spacecraft orbiting at about 50 million kilometers trailing the Earth. And each of these arms, rather than four kilometers, four kilometer LIGO arms it will be roughly two and a half million kilometers. Um, and so you can look at the details in this recent paper in the archive, this white paper essentially on the new LISA design. Uh, but here we can look at a figure from this paper, which gives you the sensitivity curve over this frequency range, which I was mentioning. Um, and specifically, what's interesting about this figure is what's plotted on here are the uh, potential sources that you can see in this uh, frequency range of gravitational radiation. Um, so as I already mentioned, here are these tracks of in-spiral and merger of massive black hole binaries. Um, and what you'll see is that at orbital periods corresponding to, you know, hours here, the binary, say 10 to the 5 solar mass binary, has about a year left of its in-spiral. So gravitational radiation will take it a year to come together and shoot across the least sensitivity curve and then merge. Um, and you can see this is at z equals 3. You can see the same type of uh, track you would see in LISA for hot, uh, larger, more massive black holes. So be able to see the last year to uh, you know, days, depending on the mass of the in-spiral of such a, a binary. Also plotted on this figure, uh, LISA will also see this so-called um, galactic binaries, which are neutron stars and white dwarfs uh, in our galaxy. And what's really nice is that there are these confirmation binaries for LISA, which marked by the blue asterisk, uh, which we know about. We have electromagnetic identification of, and we can look at electromagnetically and with LISA to confirm its operation. Um, also, I'll point out here of interest are LIGO sources before they merge. So this blue line here is the track of uh, GW150914, the first LIGO detection, which at some separation, right, was in the LISA band and would have been detectable if LISA were flying, and then came down here to the LIGO band where we saw it. And there should be a number of these uh, kind of LIGO type background of sources. Uh, beyond these kind of known sources of gravitational radiation, uh, LISA might also detect a kind of uh, low frequency cosmological background from phase transitions in the early universe, which would be exciting. And um, perhaps some unknown things. But that's the rundown on LISA. Uh, today I'm just going to be concerned with pointing out that it can uh, detect massive black hole binary mergers. OK, so then if we go to even lower frequencies, these don't correspond to the frequencies at merger of massive black hole binaries, but rather the late in spiral of the most massive black holes. So if you are looking at uh, microhertz to nanohertz, this is where 10 to 9 solar mass, 10 to 10 solar mass black holes are are finishing their, you know, last 0.1 to years of in-spiral. Um, all right. And so these lower frequency gravitational waves will be detectable by the so-called pulsar timing arrays, uh, where you use millisecond pulsars as very accurate clocks and time the pulsars for a border, you know, nanosecond changes in timing due to gravitational waves uh, passing through the Earth. So if you were to look at a bunch of these pulsars and look for correlated changes in the timing signature due to the Earth being affected by gravitational wave background, then you can hope to detect uh, these very low frequency gravitational waves. And I believe uh, Luke, who's probably here, uh, will talk more about this next week. I just want to point out that the pulsar timing arrays, you know, like Lisa and like LIGO, are going to look for single events, mergers of very massive black hole binaries, but also for what is called a gravitational wave background, a stochastic background of, of the addition of lots of gravitational waves. I mean, gravitational waves from many different sources all put together, uh, comprising a, a background in which the spectrum of this background can teach us about the... Uh, the oh, I, I should probably point out this just quickly. 
there are three separately oper operating pulsar timing arrays at the moment, one in Europe, one in America, Green Bank in Arecibo, and the Parks Pulsar Time Array in Australia, working together in, interna in the International Pulsar Timing Array. <coughs> and I just kind of like this figure to show here the uh, kind of galactic real estate and pulsars that each of these uh, collaborations have claim on. And so these are the pulsars in the sky that uh, all of these collaborations together are looking at to build these pulsar timing arrays. Um, and so I was mentioning this gravitational wave background. I just want to put one slide in here to get us thinking about this. This background, the spectrum of this, the background that you can measure with the pulsar timing arrays is very dependent on how the massive black hole binaries come together. So if you were to imagine that um, gravitational radiation alone is what drive is what is driving the final parts of the in-spiral, or not even the final parts, but most of what's driving the binaries together, then you expect a specific kind of f to the minus 3 halves uh, frequency spectrum of the background. But if, for example, and this is from Luke's paper that he's going to talk about next week, I think. Um, but for example, if the binaries have uh, significant eccentricity, or they're driven together faster or slower due to environmental effects, the shape of this background will change. And this is one of the powerful things that measurement of the background can do to teach us about the astrophysics of uh, binary black holes coming together, evolution in galactic nuclei. Um, OK, so now I'm going to just show some really, really simple pictures to give some background on how massive black hole binaries come together so we have some motivation of why we would like to, to measure this background and later talk about electromagnetic signatures. So right, there are black holes in the center of galaxies. I'll go through this quick. I think we're all <laughs> versed in this. I just like the pictures. And uh, galaxies merge often. So the question is, when the galaxies, these galaxies merge with uh, massive black hole binaries at their centers, what happens to the black holes? Do they come together? Do they merge? How quickly? How often? Um, the standard picture is that soon after the merger of the galaxies, dynamical friction brings the black holes down to the you know, center inner parsecs of the new galaxy over a dynamical uh, time of the galaxy. Um, and once the, the binary becomes close enough that the, you know, the binding energy of the binary is larger than what the uh, you know, velocity dispersion of the surrounding stars, uh, you form a hard binary. And at this point, it becomes more and more difficult to rob energy and angular momentum from you know, scattering stars off the binary because the cross-section for this becomes larger. And if you have a spherical distribution of stars, um, you quickly deplete the stellar orbits with uh, low angular momentum that can interact with the binary. And so you uh, end up with what is usually called the final parsec problem or the last parsec problem, where you have trouble bringing the binary any closer than a parsec. Um, and this is kind of depicted here in the classic study of this 1980 Begelman, Blanford, and Reese, where they show, they plot this residence time of the binary. So binaries at this separation going at this rate, how long until merger. Dynamical friction here in this plot with these parameters, you know, will take about a million years to bring the binary together if you would expect to keep going at that rate. But as I said, you deplete these stars later on that can bring the binary closer and closer in this residence time, uh, you know, spikes over the Hubble time, unless you can do something about it perhaps have interaction with gas or a non-stellar distribution of stars or some kind of massive perturber to help bring the binary past this step two here. Uh, so if you can get past this final parsec, we know that gravitational radiation will bring the binary together quickly and give us these LISA and PTA signals. Uh, so yeah, the state of it is really the classic, uh, you know, step one, obtain black holes, step two, question mark, Step three, profit. So the question is, what about step two? Question mark. Uh, OK, so as I mentioned, the gravitational wave background from the pulsar timing array can help us understand what the environmental effects are that are bringing the binaries together. Um, but also, at uh, different stages in the binary evolution, we could hope to find electromagnetic signatures of these guys because you know they're not merging in vacuum. There are, as I mentioned, gas and stars in the vicinity that, of the binary that can help bring it together. And if you can come up with unique electromagnetic identifiers at different stages in the evolution, you can try and understand a population of binaries 
which, as I hope to explain a little better, can then help you understand the mechanisms which drive the binary together past question mark stage or through merger as well. Okay, so I think that's all I'll say about that for now. Um, there's just a quick summary of that. And what I want to talk about now are what these possible electromagnetic signatures are that we can identify massive black hole binaries with and what kind of progress has been made. And then hopefully if there's time, some new ideas I've been working on here. Okay, so some of the ways to look for massive black hole binaries. At this, and I've just kind of arranged a few representative ideas here with the separation of the binary. So at the smallest separations, again, they'll be emitting gravitational waves depending on their mass and separation in the LISA or the pulsar timing array bands. <coughs> um, there are also a number of ideas that have been put forth if each of these uh, binaries uh, creates emission lines that are attached to it. You might be able to see the movement of these emission lines in time. Uh, there's centroids moving back and forth corresponding to a Keplerian motion of the binary. Um, you might, as well, might also expect perhaps that if each or one of them has a jet attached to it, then the orbital motion of this jet, the orbital motion of the binary, which a jet is attached to, would trace out wiggles on the sky. Um, there's been a few studies trying to understand if, uh, for example, 3C273 has such a, a the case going on. Um, and there have been some ideas thrown out about how tidal disruption events might look differently if there's a binary. Uh, Avi has worked on some of these. And uh, of course, at the largest separations, there's some evidence that you know dy dynamical friction does its job and brings the two AGN cores together. So they're imaging of, you know, even down to, I think, the record is seven parsec separation direct images of massive black hole binaries in the radio. Um, here we have a you know, thousand kiloparsec separation where this is a, a Chandra plus, uh, I forget what the other wavelength is actually. But, um, and then work that I've been thinking about recently and a number of other people is how to find binaries in kind of the sub parsec separation when they have periods of weeks to a decade by looking for periodic modulation of, of light curves. So assuming that the binary can emit light some way in its orbital period, create some modulation in that light at the orbital period. So you can uh, look at quasars and, and try and infer a binary's presence there uh, by looking at, as I plotted here, some type of uh, sinusoidal light curve. Or it doesn't have to be sinusoidal, but that's the main idea. So the question is, how do you generate light from a massive black hole binary, and how does it how is that light modulated periodically so that you can ask or say that it is a binary? Um, and so I, uh, one thing is when the two galaxies merge, they can funnel a lot of gas to the nuclear uh, center. And eventually, as the binary becomes hard and small enough separation, it can fit inside of a stable circumbinary gaseous disk. And a question to ask is, how does accretion, because we know that accretion drives the uh, really bright emission from AGN when the model is you have a single black hole accreting. But what might this emission look like if you have a binary black hole accreting? And this exercise tells you two uh, main things so far that we found is that you can still have large amounts of accretion onto the binary black hole, uh, the same amount or even sometimes more than you would have in the single black hole case, and that this emission can be uniquely modulated and I'm going to tell you now about what the uniquely modulated means. But here is an example. This is just a 2D hydrodynamical simulation of this gaseous circumbinary disk. You can see this is the binary orbiting. And what I've plotted are contours of surface density. And so white is high density. Black is almost zero density. And what you see happens is the binary, like a propeller, clears out this central cavity, but it can pull in streams of gas. And the dynamics in that disk uh, cause you to find specific uh, periods of modulation, which I'm going to explain now. Okay, 
So if you run kind of a parameter study of how does this accretion change when you change the mass ratio of the binary, where Q is the small mass divided by the large mass. So Q is 1 is equal mass. Q is 0 is a very small secondary in a large primary. Q approaches 0. Um, and you see if you just take snapshots of kind of quasi-steady state uh, end states of these types of hydrodynamical simulations, you see a wide range of behavior as you increase the mass ratio. And what we find is that this also corresponds to a wide range in uh, variability behavior, which can be split into three regimes. So if you have very small mass ratios, less than of order you know, 0 0.04, you find that you get steady accretion, where most of the gas is pulled in by the smaller secondary black hole and accretes relatively steadily. But if you increase this mass ratio, you enter this type of what I call an orbital time scale regime, where you modulate the accretion rate and presumably then the luminosity that comes out from this accretion at the orbital period. And if you increase to a mass ratio is closer to equal mass, you enter this three time scale regime where you have a, a periodicity at the orbital period, but also at a much longer period, which I'll explain, and then at a harmonic of this orbital period, usually at twice the, the, uh, twice the orbital period, sometimes a little bit different. Yeah, yep. Right, that's an excellent question because in this case I mentioned that the secondary accretes uh, much more than the primary, so you'd expect uh, kind of trajectories of the mass ratio to move towards these more equal mass ratios. Um, in these simulations, we've only, we haven't allowed that evolution to occur, but uh, I imagine it could. I just don't know what the end state would always would always be. How much is a yeah? If you have if you have of order the binary mass to accrete then it could be that you approach near equal mass black holes, but I don't have a definitive answer. <coughs> I will. Uh, at the moment, um, at the moment, I would say of order, you know, five to ten years, the upper limit because we haven't waited long enough, we don't have surveys long enough to get multiple periods that are ten years. And on the lower limit, the shorter the period of the binary, the, the more rare it is because it spends less time at that separation. So, I mean, I, I think I'll mention this a little bit in a, in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I just wanted to explain what the reason for the transition between those regimes quickly because um, we've studied this quite a bit. It's interesting that this mass ratio, 0 0.04 roughly, is where, this is dynamics now, where you no longer have orbital stable orbits. Meaning if you've ever heard of horseshoe orbits, these are these orbits like in the solar system that here's the secondary, here's the primary, that go in these horseshoe shapes and just cycle in and out. And usually if you have something like viscosity, which is driving gas inwards, um, in the, when you have stable co-orbital horseshoe orbits, the gas comes in and transitions from outer and inner disk on these stable orbits. And so what you find is that when you no longer have these stable orbits at larger mass ratios, you get a kind of transition in the, in the behavior of the disk. And what happens, I'll play a movie here on the left, is that these stable orbits transfer gas from outer to inner, and you end up in this kind of stationary state. But once you lose these orbits, you have more of a um, matter is kind of not stably transferred from in to out, and you create these kind of oscillating uh, disk patterns, which give you this orbital time scale accretion rate. Um, and so we have put together a study on how exactly this transition occurs, but the, we think the basic uh, thing that's happening is this dynamical change in mass ratio of loss of stable horseshoe orbits. Yeah? yeah? These are 2D calculations. So how much uh, of the correction is there for matter state overflowing above and below the secondary? Right. So if you have a, th a thicker disk, which of course can't be captured in a 2D calculation, uh, then it might be that in the thicker disk case, you can just uh, overwhelm the need to transition on these horseshoe orbits. But I, I mean, I haven't studied. I haven't studied it in the three-dimensional case, and I don't think there are many. So there are three-dimensional MHD 
simulations of similar systems, but I am not sure how many of these are in the small mass ratio regime in the planet literature. There likely are. Um, but usually the, the 3D MHD simulations are looking at the more equal mass ratios and they find, they do find these similar periodicities, but I can't say much about the dependence uh, on this transition. Where would this transition change if you had thick 3D disks? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I'm sorry for all the interruptions, but no. quasars are, you know, holding on to maybe a future concept of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then they're really only typically on for a few percent of the time. What what restores it again? Um, well, so one way you can go about that is saying that um, mergers trigger quasars. Um, and actually, I'll mention that a little later. But if mergers trigger quasars, then the lifetime of the binary is essentially the ten to the seven, ten to the eight year lifetime of the quasar. And the number that you'll see or the fraction you'll see in the sky has to do with the resonance time of the binary relative to that quasar lifetime. Um, maybe I'll say more and hopefully I can address that better. Uh, okay, so I was just, okay, yeah, we don't, I think we don't need to see these, but they're kind of nice. So just tracing these, the gas moving on these horseshoe orbits in the stable small mass ratio case, and you see an opposite effect these are just passive scalars of the flow, showing you how gas is moving in and out of the orbit. Uh, okay, so there's this third regime when you go to more equal mass ratios. And so you go from simply having kind of this binary orbital frequency and this harmonic to it, two times the orbital frequency, because each black hole pulls in a stream, um, to having a similar scenario with these to binary and you know sometimes a harmonic, sometimes uh, 1.5 times the orbital frequency, plus this large, more powerful, uh, longer time scale component periodicity. And this has to do with a, another kind of change in the accretion behavior where you create these elongated lopsided cavities. And these streams kind of create, kind of, uh, create this overdense lump that you see orbiting around. And every time the lump orbits at this cavity wall, you have an increase in accretion rate due to a larger feeding rate. So this modulates this orbital frequency at a longer, sometimes 5 to 10 orbital period uh, modulation. When you talk about the accretion, uh, mm -hmm. is it layer associated with how much time it takes the gas to make it in the accretion disk around? Right, so that's, so a, that's that, a good... If that delays more than the orbital time, you smooth out. It's right, so there is a possibility that you know, there's you have to have visc some something bring the, the gas down to the to the disco. So I'm what I'm here tracking here, what I'm making periodograms of are accretion rates, but turning accretion rate into a luminosity, uh, obvious thing, could be buffered by the time scale to bring gas down to the black hole. Um, this is a possibility, and there are some people working on these simulations of just the these little mini discs alone. Uh, but there could be shorter time scale processes such as uh, uh, torques from the other component that, that, that drive the, these accretion rates into a luminosity. And I'll also mention now another mechanism that even if this, you have this buffering of luminosity and you get a steady, a steady luminosity even though you have a variable accretion rate, could be overcome by uh, what I'll talk about next. And so I just wanted to paint this kind of picture for you with mass ratio. I haven't said anything about eccentricity. I know that um, there are a few groups that are uh, working on what happens to this kind of periodicity when you have eccentric binaries, which you might expect actually because these lopsided uh, cavities that I showed you can drive the binary to become eccentric, which is important for Luke's work in understanding the gravitational wave background. Um, but for now, I just wanted to put this uh, kind of mass ratio dependent picture of what you might expect from the periodicities because it's, it's interesting to try and for example, look for these uh, perhaps smoking gun signature if you have these three type, this three uh, periodicity time scales, and it can also help you infer the mass ratio. So uh, now, even if the accretion rate is steady, either because you have a small mass ratio or because uh, 
you have buffering in these mini disks that don't allow the accretion rate to turn into a periodic luminosity. Um, often the periods or the orbital velocities of these binaries are large enough that you can have an observer dependent uh, change in observed flux from the relativistic Doppler boost. So in this small mass ratio case, you know that the secondary is usually giving off most of the emission, depends on what wave band you're looking in. Uh, but it's usually giving off it's the brightest uh, emitter that has the highest accretion rate. Uh, and its orbital velocity can you know, approach a uh, tenth of the speed of light. And what I want to show you then, I think I've showed you these slides before, but uh, that this, just because the binary is moving towards and away from you, can create a, a brightening and dimming due to the relativistic Doppler boost. And this depends on the slope of the spectrum you're observing in, which allows you to look and kind of confirm that this is happening by looking at, at different uh, wave bands with, with different spectral slopes. So I just wanted to illustrate that. Um, right here is the binary, primary. Secondary is giving off all the light. We're observing it from here. And if we're looking in the V band, for example, with a specific spectral slope drawn here, we you know, integrate the flux in this wave band and plot its uh, you know, total V band flux over time. As the binary moves towards us, the relativistic Doppler boost um, causes the secondary emission to look brighter due to uh, time dilation and aberration alone, but also from the, the blue shift of the spectrum. Here we have see a larger integrated flux. And that extra flux we see just in the blue shift is dependent on what I call alpha here, which is the spectral slope. So you imagine, right, as the binary orbits, we see this sinusoidal modulation in time. Um, if the binary is eccentric, it wouldn't be sinusoidal, but it'd have a different shape. And so then the idea, if you look in V-band, you would expect some magnitude based on the spectral slope here. But if you looked in, for example, the UV, where there is a steeper slope, then you would predict a, a larger amplitude of modulation at the same period. And so I just wanted to mention uh, that this is a actual, so we use this kind of uh, Doppler boost idea to interpret a, a recently kind of identified massive black hole binary candidate that was identified in, I'll show you here, the optical, which are these gray points from the Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey, to be a quasar with what seems to be a uh, 0.14 amplitude in, in magnitudes, uh, amplitude of modulation at this kind of five-year observed period. Um, what we found is that that the orbital velocity of a binary at that period with the measured mass would give you, if you have the correct mass ratio and inclination, would give you the right amplitude of modulation. And furthermore, if you look in the UV, you would predict a 2.3 times larger amplitude modulation due to the measured spectral slope in the UV, just as I showed you. And so there aren't many points, but now this prediction we've compared with UV measurements from Galax and Hubble, and so far they hold up. So this has allowed us so far to inter interpret PG1302 as a, a massive black hole binary that's modulating its emission due to the relativistic Doppler boost. So it's, uh, if I were to put numbers on it, a roughly you know, 20 to 1 mass ratio binary where the smaller guy is giving off most of the emission. And that beam, it's moving at 7% the speed of light, and that's beaming the emission. Um, but this is only one candidate. Um, I think I'll get to briefly uh, saying something about what Josh asked earlier. What would we want to do to learn about the, you know, the evolution of massive black hole binaries if we have a population of them? And <clears throat> what you can ask yourself is, if I have a model for how the binary comes together, some gas, gas is bringing the binary together, and then later times gravitational waves are bringing the binary together, how would I expect the fraction of binaries I see in the sky to change as that model changes. For example, binaries with larger separations, perhaps larger periods, would spend longer time, that, time at that separation. And then if you look at another binary at a smaller uh, separation, it would spend less time there. But exactly how much less time depends on the model that you put forth. And so if you were to look at, say, a survey of uh, 100,000 quasars, 
and ask how many of them are binaries with one year periods. And uh, uh, for example, you would ask, well, how long will a binary stay at a one year period? What's the residence time there? And divide this residence time by how long the quasar that it's in should be on for. And you can kind of define a duty cycle for uh, binaries at a given period mass, mass ratio on the sky. Um, <clears throat> and so here's an example from a paper from 2009 by uh, Zoltan Hyman and Ben Sekoschus and Krista Manu, where they put together you know, gas and gravitational wave models and compute what these residence times should be. And so just to give you an example here, the black parts of these lines are due to gravitational wave-driven merger alone. And so you can calculate so what should be the fraction of binaries at a given variability period due to gravitational wave driven merger? And we know the residence time from gravitational waves is proportional to the period of the binary to the 8 thirds over the mass to the 5 thirds over the symmetric mass ratio. And then uh, you can go ahead and <coughs> excuse me, look for example, if you find uh, binaries with a specific period, they should have a residence time of uh, you know, 10 to the 5 years, which means 1% 1 of 1 of binaries you'd expect to find at, at that period. Uh, I don't know if I made that <laughs> clear. But the idea is if you have a population of these binaries and a model for how they come together, then you can ask how, what fraction of quasars in the sky should show periodicity of that period. And you can start to bet models for what is bringing the binaries together. So the idea is to make these observations be try and make yourself sure that you're seeing binaries and find unique signatures of these binaries to, to, to do exactly what I was mentioning here. And so beyond this one candidate, PG1302, this kind of periodic light curve strategy has been applied to a few data sets of a couple hundred thousand quasars from Catalina and also the Palomar transient factory. And so, my, uh, so these guys at JPL and some of my colleagues at Columbia have done this. They've just looked at quasar light curves and tried to pull out sinusoidal variations, and uh, you know, of course, modeling uh, the quasar noise you would expect. Uh, we can talk about that later. But the result so far is that there are order you know 130 or 140 candidates of this type. And what I've plotted here is just so you can visualize the mass, which is usually measured from single epic uh, broadline measurements. Uh, versus the rest frame period, period, so the observed over 1 plus c. And here's PG1302. Here's a old famous guy, OJ287, up here. And here I've put contours of how long until uh, merger. So you say candidates. Mm -hmm. What did they do? So what they did, what they did was uh, assume a model for the quasar noise, the damped round and walk model and make as many realizations of this noise as there are frequency bins times quasars in the sample. And that gives you kind of a, a background power spectrum to compare peaks from individual quasars to. So that you can make a p-value from this background noise and then the Fourier transform or lom scargle of a given light curve. All these curve. guys have... All these guys have right. right. How big a sample? How many did not? <clears throat> I think there are two samples. This is about 250,000 quasars, and 100 of them were candidates which you can start to ask if that fits the statistics of what you'd expect from merger rates. And we've done a little bit of that. And the, this was 35,000 quasars, and there are about 30 candidates. How many data points per quasar? Um, uh, I wish I had a plot of that. I don't know how many points, but it's, 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 it's much more than Nyquist sampled, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Um, I think that was a criteria that, that you have to have. Yeah. Well, I can. I don't think that's a problem, but I, I don't have a plot of what these light curves look like at the moment. Um, and, and so yeah, those can be uncertain. I didn't put error bars on here, so forgive me. But these are from single epic broadline measurements, right? So you're extrapolating um, what we know from reverberation mapping and local mass measurements to uh, you know, looking at a broad line and, and saying that's roughly the mass because we have that broad line width. Um, <clears throat> so there are a number of things. So in, in Maria's paper here, she did look at this sample and say, um, 
I have a mass and a period. I don't know the mass ratio, but I can assume a mass ratio. Call it 1 to 100, 1 to 10, 1. Then given each of these points, I can you know, bin what the residence time is. And then I can calculate from these models what the expected residence time would be with a fall off for uh, observational effects, like the baseline of the survey is only so long. <clears throat> and what's interesting just from this preliminary, preliminary kind of interpretation is that if all of these binaries have very extreme mass ratios, one to 100, then it seems to give you the best fit to this uh, observed residence time profile. So uh, there's much more to do with this, but that's an interesting kind of intriguing thing to think about so far because I did mention that these low mass ratio systems are what you would expect to give you the strongest kind of... But look at that extreme guy. Yeah. The primary is itself less than 10 to the 6 polar masses. So you would say that the This guy? Yeah. Yeah, so the, in that case, the, the secondary is 10 to the 4. It's an intermediate mass black. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that satellites of galaxies that are more than 10% right. massive. I was going to mention this, yes. Yeah. ...sink to the center, but those that are light will stay. So if you look at the Milky Way, all the satellites are low-mass satellites. Yeah, and, and this cutoff is right around here. Yeah. So what Avi is saying is that dynamical friction is no longer efficient when you have extreme mass ratio mergers because the smaller guy, right, it has these you know gas and stars around it which help dynamical friction bring it in quickly, but those can be stripped before it's brought in and it's left sitting there as a naked black hole. And that cutoff where you would expect uh, binaries to form is, you know, about this 1 to 100 mass ratio. Um, so I guess I just wanted to put this up as an example of what is starting to be able to be thought about with... Uh, but I, th I think what also needs more work is making sure that these are actually massive black hole binaries, right? All I've told you is that from our, our models, we think binaries can create these periodicities. Uh, so you don't expect uh, more like extreme Emory types in the punical 20 to the 0, 1 or something to oh. as well because the gas is being stripped off. And... Yeah, only based on this argument that you wouldn't expect binaries to form with that extreme mass ratio. I'm not saying there aren't ways to do it, but uh, I, I don't know of <laughs> any. Okay, I think we're getting close to the end of the time here, so I just wanted to mention some new thoughts that I'm working on about how to, you know, how to vet these candidates, right? They're uh, pulled out periodic light curves that, that fit the, the mold from quasars. But how, and, and in the relativistic Doppler boost case, we have even more evidence that, it, that this modulation in multiple wave bands fits what we would expect from a, a binary of that period. Um, but I just wanted to mention something I'm working on with Roseanne, which I think is really interesting, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's the case. <laughs> um, and I'll just mention this and, and say two more words and wrap up. But uh, so the idea is, if we think back again to this case where relativistic Doppler boost is causing the sinusoidal periation, depending, and we're, we're watching this happen, uh, right, the guy comes towards us and it gets brighter away, dimmer. Then depending on the inclination of the binary, this is the secondary giving off a lot of the light, uh, you can get lensing of the secondary emission by the primary. And so we were thinking about what this might look like in the light curves because if you do have this Doppler uh, boost sinusoid, then this lensing will have it at a very specific point in the phase when it, when it comes right behind the primary. And if you do a simple thing and calculate uh, point source lens by a point mass, which is okay for certain separations, then you can find, depending on the inclination of the binary, you can get, you know, <coughs> uh, decently large magnifications during the light curve just from lensing. And these will be, if you have a point source, achromatic and at a specific phase, which is, uh, would be an interesting signature of a binary. And so furthermore, I can plot those candidates here on the same period versus mass uh, plot and ask, one, what's the probability of lensing, which you can calculate by saying if I watch the thing for more than an orbit, what's the probability that the inclination puts the secondary within one Einstein radius on the sky. And those uh, I've written as percentages here in the dashed curves. 
And so you can see right in the heart of where these candidates are, it's not a small percentage that you might expect a lensing event. It's 10%. What about the for the reason for the scan? Carl, the image of the other If there is, OK, so if the primary has a large accretion disk, yeah. and that's optically thick, the there is a possibility that would obscure the, um, the emission from the secondary. So there will be certain separations where that would happen. But it would also require the primary to be have a face-on disk, which might be a special arrangement. Yeah, it depends on the geometry. Yeah, it depends on the geometry. It could be a feature or a problem. Like it, could it could be a, a separate feature as long as it doesn't block out the whole event. But that's yeah, that's another point. Then you might expect a absorption in the light curve. Uh, James. Yes. If they're, if, yeah, if all of these systems are small, if we are biased to see relativistic Doppler boost candidates, then they would be biased to be closer to edge on, and that would mean this probability would be higher it, within the candidate list. So uh, another interesting point. And a similar calculation gives you that the time scale, what I plotted here, of the lensing event is days to year. So that's also usually within the cadence of these time domain surveys. And I've also uh, just... As a last point here, I showed you this you know, estimate of the light curves in this point source, point uh, lens approximation. But you can ask, when is the accretion disk large on the size compared to the Einstein radius of the primary? And this happens in this region where I've shaded yellow, roughly. Um, and in this case, you'll have finite source effects in your lensing. And could open up. So I've just zoomed in on the peak here. And this kind of estimate of what this uh, wavelength dependent now uh, lensing would look like because as the accretion disk moves past behind the lens, you start lensing the outer parts, which are lower wavelength, and then the inner parts, which are higher wavelength emission, which could allow you uh, possibly even to map the accretion structure of the secondary. So, and then here, as you get very close separation binaries, you have to rely on ray tracing in the curve space time to get a more accurate estimate. And we haven't done that, but I have a video, so I thought it'd be cool to look at. <laughs> so this is the Doppler boost making it dimmer, and then this magnification due to the change in the geometry in the sky. And so I think this would be really interesting to think about. And I'm going to stop here. There's some other things. I'm just uh, put out a page. <laughs> well, I, I'll go back to it. <laughs> I just want to say we just put out a paper on the archive which talks about this periodic UV optical emission being uh, echoed by dust which could be surrounding the binary. And there's some really interesting things you can learn from that. Uh, one is that we applied these models to PG-1302, which this is the actual IR data for PG-1302 and the optical that I showed you or earlier. We can find consistent IR models, which uh, you know, can ask whether it's Doppler boost illuminating the dust like a lighthouse or whether it's isotropic illumination due to periodic accretion. And I think we don't have time. It will be for another talk, but I think Avi and I are working on something very interesting, which is the possibility of imaging these binary black holes with the very long baseline interferometry. So stay on hold for that. Uh, I'll put the movie on. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs>
time scales. I've seen people try to bootstrap uh, sampling. It's not very good. So have you extrapolated around to Alice's T time, so where you have very deep observations, regular? And because you're only looking at optical, that plot that you're showing on the top left is very interesting if you have coordinated observations mm -hmm. or some certain field to which you could uh, really be able to constrain this, right? Because I guess all you're looking at is a point source, and you're seeing it change with time, so you want some other uh, ways of vetting, extreme vetting, extreme right? Vetting. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that you're happy yeah. with them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think we'll definitely LSST will be a, a huge, a huge boom of these types of candidates, because you can watch an entire huge body of the sky for a long time in a pretty period of time. You'll season. have the depth that you need and the, 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 the volume of sky, and then coordinating with other observations as well. Like at the moment, you haven't gone through with seeing, looking for spectroscopic changes, anything else that could uh, actually... Currently, happen. with Maria at Columbia, we're, we're looking at, uh, we're measuring the spectral slopes of all of these and trying to find UV data you know, to understand whether they're dark with those candidates or not. So we're, we're also trying to follow up in infrared on all of them, because they're all in the WISE catalog. So these things are starting. but. Uh, for now, we just yeah, have these optical light curves from I should the mention that, that we've, that Dan and, and Maria looked at PG-102 in our DASH data. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard about it from Matthew Graham and George Shugowski, I looked as well. And it's there. It's a marginal detection, uh, you know, in a 100-year data set. But we now think we can do better <coughs> on the photometry. It's going to be a fairly, <coughs> excuse me. Fairly massive code rewrite, but something that we will do. Yeah, in which case, it open yes. up. Uh, Wait, marginal uh, detection of what? Of, of, of the five year period. You're actually you seeing the period. Yeah, we've over 100 years. Yeah. Wow. That is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> You're seeing yeah, lensing? Sorry? Are you seeing lensing? No. I haven't looked for that. Now you know what to look for. It'll right. be well, that, that's an interesting point <laughs> because this. Uh, <laughs> These candidates are all look for with you know they're looking for one peak a sinusoid yeah. and if it's messier than that just they're periodic maybe they it's you could miss mm -hmm. yeah. yeah candidates in, in principle you can see a, a binary that on its way electromagnetic on its way to become a lisa source and then a light and then a wait with a, say just a, a lisa source. I mean you can in principle perceive lisa alerting lisa to something that may, Oh, right, so confirmation massive black hole binaries rather than confirmation white dwarf binaries. Yeah. All right, so on that note, let's just do some tech down again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.